Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, in today's episode, we're going to be talking about designing a long life full of love, purpose, well-being, and friendship at any age using the creative tools of award-winning product designer Aisha Bursell. Let's go. Welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle, with over a million downloads and counting. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, your master certified coach and midlife mentor, and I am so glad to be here with you again. So I just wanted to tell you a couple of things that I have going on right now that are bringing me joy and things that I'm grateful for. The first one, my baby plants. I am making a big effort this year to start vegetable and flower seedlings inside. And I have to say, I am having so much fun babying my babies. (laughs) I have my little toothpicks ready to go and I'm using the toothpicks to prop them up and I'm spritzing them and everything and taking very good care of them. And I have to say, it is fun and they're doing well. Now, the second thing is the return of my use of one of my favorite apps ever, the Merlin app for bird lovers. It's basically a bird sound identifier and it is so much fun. Have you found this app yet? The Cornell Lab puts it out and it is fantastic. It also does bird photo identification, but really it's the sound identifying that's so much fun. So if you're into birds, it is free and it's fabulous. So I just had to share. I hope you don't mind, but I would love to hear if you could send me an email if you are doing any of those two things and how it's going for you and if you're having a lot of fun too. Now, you're going to love this interview today. My guest brings a unique perspective to the topic of designing your life on purpose. It is so interesting. Um, Oh, but just quick, um, there are two things I want to tell you. First, I want to make sure that you know about a free gift that I have for you called Regret Proof Your Vision. And really, it's about regret proofing your vision board. So do you want to make a vision board that really works? Have you made them before? You know, some people make them for the new year or for your career or for um, some people like to do it for bucket list ideas or your future or vacations, anything. You can make them specific or you can make them more broad, it doesn't matter. But I pulled together a free and powerful vision board brainstorming template, and it's the perfect way for you to start thinking about what you want to create in your life on purpose. So download your Regret Proof Your Vision Board worksheet and learn seven easy steps to make a vision board that really works. Head over to www.susierosenstein.com forward slash regret proof vision. And second, I have a new opportunity to tell you about. I have a sister podcast called Women in the Middle Entrepreneurs, and I'm currently looking for guests. So if you're a woman in the middle who's 50 plus and also an entrepreneur or a business owner who's actively dealing with navigating around and through classic midlife related obstacles and challenges while you're trying to run your business, this new podcast is especially for you. And if you're interested in learning more about how to be a guest, head over to www.midlifeinterviews.com and apply. There's lots more information there so you can see if you're a good fit for this show. Okay, my friend, let me introduce you to my amazing guest on the podcast today. Today's episode is all about designing a long life you love, beyond expectations, beyond limiting beliefs. When you're older, you tend to be more open to actually exploring what you expect of life. Finally, (laughs) Or hopefully you're at least open to the idea that it's time to put yourself first and hopefully, again, hopefully you're ready to start saying goodbye to reactivity and hello to being more intentional. My guest today is Aisha Bursell. Aisha is one of the world's leading industrial designers. Her work can be found in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, She has helped thousands of people across the globe transform their lives by teaching them how to solve life's problems using design, which has earned her the nickname Design Evangelista. Her goal is to improve 10 million lives through her movement, Design the Life You Love. She's one of the most creative people in business, according to Fast Company. She's recognized as the number one coach for life design 
by Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches. Her new book, Design the Long Life You Love, was published in December 2022. And what's really cool about it is that she did year-long research with older people and treated the book as a collaboration. Design the Long Life You Love offers readers of all ages, from those in their 20s and 30s, just starting out, to those in midlife looking for change, to those in later life who are the experts for us all, thought-provoking questions, exercises for exploration, and interviews with innovative entrepreneurs and thought leaders to guide them on their own journeys of crafting the next phase of life. You are going to get a lot from this interview and really appreciate Aisha's innovative approach to helping us all design a life you love. So please enjoy. Hi, Aisha. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Women in the Middle podcast. Susie, thank you so much for having me. I was very excited to get you on the show. I love your take on looking at life and making it as amazing as possible. So I thought we'd start a little bit by you telling us a bit about who you are and how you got into industrial design. And then we're going to talk about your midlife funk. So let's start there. (laughs) So interesting. Great. So I grew up in Turkey in a family of lawyers. And I knew early on I didn't want to be a lawyer. I wanted to do something creative. And I thought architecture But then a family friend came to tea, you know, in Turkey, you drink a lot of tea. And, and he asked me if I had thought of industrial design. And I had never heard those words together before. And he said, look, you know, we're having tea and somebody designed this teacup and the edge is curved so it can fit our lips better. It has a handle so we don't burn ourselves holding hot liquids. And it has a saucer so that if you spill your tea, you won't ruin your mother's beautiful tablecloth. (laughs) And I fell in love with this idea of industrial design. And I thought, this is so human, you know, and I'm I'm still in love. (laughs) And I've designed everything from toilet seats to office systems to potato peelers as an industrial designer. It's amazing you mentioned potato peelers. My son is, he's a bit of a cook and he is very fancy and he really loves really, he's a foodie. He really, really loves everything about food and preparation and cooking. And he has given me a lecture and a half about a peeler. (laughs) (laughs) He, He criticized every peeler I had in the house. He bought the one he thought was the best and now it is the best. And, um, I couldn't believe it made such a difference, but I never noticed and I never appreciated that design could be better. I wonder which one he got. Does it have a soft handle? No, and I wouldn't remember. I'd have to run to the kitchen and pull it out, which means (laughs) I would also have to find which drawer it was in. (laughs) Okay. I'll follow up. I'll follow up. I'll talk to to your son about that. (laughs) Yeah, and I would love to know what one you recommend or the one you designed. That would be really exciting. Great. So uh, what about toilet design, though? How did that happen? You know, um, I, again, coming from Turkey, uh, in Turkey, there's this whole Ottoman culture of baths and, you know, the Turkish toilet and all that. So I was invited to Japan to go to a seminar organized by Toto. And, you know, Toto is now quite well known in the States. And, but at the time they hadn't really entered the American market. And so when I went to the seminar, they expressed interest in having me come and live in Tokyo and design toilets for them. And I, it was a dream come true. So that's what I did. <laughs> and, and I actually designed um, what's known as the world's most comfortable toilet seat <gasps> un- unofficially because it's designed like a chair uh, not literally, but it's, uh, you know, it's comfortable like a chair, except it has a hole in it. And, uh, and it's very easy to clean. So then um, I became known as queen of toilets for a while. <laughs> I guess and, there are worse things to be known for. <laughs> exactly. Not many designers can say that queen of toilets. You know? <laughs> oh, that is that is so funny. And, you know, I was recently um, on a trip on a sailing trip. And I wanted to bring my water bottle, my favorite water bottle. 
and it broke. I dropped it just before the trip and the whole handle and everything broke. So I went to the store and I bought one, the same brand, and I thought it was the same thing, but it was a newer generation of them. And as I was using it, here it is, I'm holding it up on Zoom. And as I was using it on the boat, just in November, I'm like, there's something wrong with this. There's a design flaw. This oh. this little handle hits you in the nose when you drink. The handle has to be down. And oh. I just thought something's wrong with this. Some designer made a boo-boo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't that fun when you when you catch those things? I just thought there's a problem. My other one didn't hit me in the nose. (laughs) Anyway, one of the things that we love um, to talk about on the podcast is everybody's um, midlife funk story, like when you were stuck and how that affected your life. So tell us a little bit about your stuck story. (laughs) I'm afraid I have more than one, but okay. (laughs) (laughs) I think the first time I really felt stuck and it, it it was in midlife is when 2008, the economy crashed and we were so successful as a design studio. Uh, we worked with some of the best brands you could imagine. And I thought, okay, you know, the economy crashed, but it won't touch us. So famous last words, of course, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all our clients took their work in house because it made sense for them. You know, they had to cut budgets. And I found myself, uh, our kids were young at the time. So two young kids and you need to take care of your family and no work. And that, that was a serious funk. Oh, I love yeah. the word funk that you use, you know, <laughs> and, um, and it's something that's outside of your control, right? And you think you can control these things and not really. So, um, and it's in that way, it's similar to COVID, you know, Something happens and like you have to rethink everything. And the only way I know how to think is through design and design process. And I have one of my oldest friends and collaborators, Leah Kaplan, uh, who said to me, look, Aisha, you have all this time in your hands, no clients. So why don't you use this time to think about how you think, how you create? Because she says you think differently. And Susie, that was like a lifeline that one person Mm. still believed in that I had something to offer. And Mm. so I listened to her and I worked through that um, year on how I think, kind of like a deep dive into my brain. Like, how do I go from what I know today to what I can imagine tomorrow and develop the process, deconstruction, reconstruction. And then that process got us actually our first big project post uh, the uh, recession, but I also wanted to apply it to our life. And so we can talk about that, but I guess what I want to say is if it hadn't been for that funk, you and I wouldn't be talking here together today. I love that. I love that. And one of the things that people forget sometimes is not only how much they know, but how much you can learn from somebody else because you know so much. So it's not just a casual conversation. It was somebody else with wisdom and insight. And then you, yes. your bank of expertise and experience is interpreting what she's saying to you. And then it's like, pow, it's just unbelievable creativity that can come from that as you start to think and apply whatever it is you learned to your life. But I'm really curious how you started to think about the intersection between design and life. Like, why were you even thinking about life? Was it because of your age? No, it was because I had this gut feeling that our life is our biggest project. And uh, and I would say that my mission in life is to design the life I love, but I didn't know really what I meant. And so when I developed this process, um, I thought, well, this would be an interesting proof point. You know, can I apply this process to my life? And it started as an experiment. I was my first student because I had to kind of try it out. And then I I thought this kind of works. And then I had another friend who, uh, Shirley Moulton, who had just started a company teaching people, she said, things we don't learn at school, Academy of Life. Uh, And she said, why don't you come and do a workshop? 
And so that was the first workshop. I had never done a workshop before. <laughs> and, <laughs> but I had learned through the recession that when somebody asks you to do something, you say yes. A hundred percent. Figure it out later. <laughs> yeah, figure it out later. And, um, and then it grew word of mouth. You know, um, people told their friends, their friends told their friends. And yeah. That's amazing. So you have a lot of interesting ideas in the book. The book is called Design the Long Life You Love and a, a step-by-step guide to love, purpose, well-being, and friendship. And of course, I have a link in the show notes. You have so many ideas in here. As I was reading it, I'm like, there's too much here to talk about in an interview. <laughs> everything <laughs> was so back. interesting. <laughs> so when you think about your book and you think about midlife women, what is the most important concept in the book that you want to share? Oh, that's, that's such a good question to get to the heart of things. Um, Susie, first of all, I want to mention that as women, we're incredibly courageous. So um, when I started doing design, the life you love, it was mostly women who would come to them mm. until I started doing a version of it that I call design the work you love. And then men started showing up as well. But so interesting. <laughs> it's so interesting. And I would say, look, as women, we're not afraid to deconstruct our life, to reconstruct it and imagine different ways of how our life could go forward in a way that's based on our values, that's original to us. So, um, and in terms of midlife women and midlife in general, um, you know, our life is quite structured early on. We have a very clear roadmap, most of us, right? So um, you grow up, you go to school, and then you try to do well, you graduate, you get some work, and you try to earn a living. And then hopefully you're, you have a family, you have a partner, and then you might have kids. And it kind of develops that way. And until you get to your 40s or so, and you know this, right? 40s and 50s, and you feel like, okay, I've done most of the things that I was set, set out to do. And most of us, you know, ups and downs, but mostly successfully. And then you think, well, what's next? <laughs> it's like and the big blank. <laughs> the big blank. And in the book, I talk about like all the things that come before are ready-made purpose. The st social structures are there to keep you going. But these things eventually kind of recede. And you have to figure out your own purpose, the meaning of your life yourself. And I call that self-made purpose. And not many of us have experience in that. And so that's why we have a crisis, you know. And, and I try to show people, here's how you can do this, how you can think about purpose, meaning, your values. And, and we did the research with people who were 65 and older. And it's really those lessons that come then help us um, through this transition, um, no matter what our age, really. I love that. I definitely want to talk more about that. But I, I just remember when it happened to me, I was in a job for a long time, for 19 years, part of a 27-year career. And wow. for the last five years of the 19 years, I just wasn't happy. I wasn't content. That was the word that I used to describe. There was nothing wrong with my job. I liked the organization. I liked what I was doing, but I'd just been doing it too long. So I didn't have enough growth uh, anymore. I was very stagnant and I wasn't content any longer. And it's interesting. The year I turned 50, I got laid off. It was the same year that my first kid of three went to university. So I didn't have an emptying nest, but I had an emptying nest. It still was enough to get my head around that was a little bit weird and different and a little scary. But you know, you'd think that when you have more flexibility in front of you, and so many of us are craving flexibility, that with, with the blank, the blank in front of us would be more welcomed and exciting. But it, it isn't. Because of what you're describing, we, we're used to having some kind of guidance, some kind of a roadmap. We rely on expectations to some degree. 
And the blank becomes scary, even though we have more flexibility. Many of us, for the first time in our lives, we have more wealth, we have more resources, we have more experience. And we have, generally speaking, more flexibility, not complete freedom, obviously, but yet it's so scary. Yeah. And what did you, um, what did you learn about that, about why having a blank becomes scary? To me, the really, the, the reason it's scary is because we don't have a process to go about it. And the reason that I work in this uh, area and write books about it is because I've experienced that if I can share my process with people, then they're extraordinarily creative. And it's a step-by-step -step process that are all simple steps, but they trigger your creativity and they add up to something. And suddenly you're thinking about the same things differently. And you're starting to have ideas. And I found that um, when you have ideas, then you're excited. And then you have the energy to do things. So my goal is to get people to that kind of thinking. And I talk about it as, uh, you know, turning your inner pessimism into an outer optimism. And it's through design process that's incredibly accessible. Wow. So what is design process? Because it's like an everyday term for you, but for many of us, yes. we don't know what it means. <laughs> okay. But first I want to show you for your listeners who could see us. Oh, they can't see us. It's just they audio. Can't see us. Okay. Then I'll tell them if you get my book, turn on to page 21. I can um, include it in the show notes. I can take it. Oh, that a, would be great. Yeah. Page yeah. 21. And I'll tell them what it says is, um, there comes a time in your life when, you know, up to a point, it's you do what life expects of you. And then in your 50s, when you're talking with Susie, you, <laughs> you start to notice you want to do what you expect of life. And that transition, I think, is really the key here. Yeah. But to be able to do it, I mean, you have many tools. Um, and my tools are design tools. So th that process is a four-step process. And I start with deconstruction. And deconstruction is taking the whole apart. So in this case, taking your life, breaking it into its parts and pieces. Because life is a complex topic. But if you can see, okay, what's my life made up of? Like, I have friends, I have work, I have family, I travel, I have hobbies, and you start to see parts of it, and that makes it more feasible. And you can you know, break those pieces into its parts as well. But in doing that, and often what I suggest people do that on a piece of paper, you know, it's really important to have that connection from your brain onto something you can see. So write about it, draw it, map it out. You don't have to draw beautifully, but you know, just map it out. So you, like a roadmap, so you can see it. Um, and when you do that, you realize, oh, so this is what my life is made up of. And some of these things I can change because now they're not connected anymore, you know, and you can see this is important to me. This is something that I want to change. This is something I want to avoid. The second step is how can you think about those same parts in a different way, and that's about gathering inspiration. And I use different tools, metaphors is one, you know, to help you think of your, what's your life metaphor so that you can think about your life differently. And then another one is um, heroes. I ask people to think about their heroes and, and from their heroes, connect them with their values. And that's about gathering inspiration. And, you know, we can try one of these together if you want. So as an example. Sure. Would you like to do that? Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you, Susie, who is your hero when it comes to your life? Somebody that you maybe notice who has um, 
qualities that you admire, and it could be someone you know, or it could be someone you know of, but somebody who inspires you. Well, the the first image I had was from, uh, and this has come up a few times on the podcast. It was my high school band director. Ooh. His nickname was Fred. He passed, unfortunately, um, but he was definitely a very important role model uh, for a lot of reasons. So he, at, a, at an important time in my life where I really needed a male role model. So tell us a little bit more. What were his qualities that you noticed? Well, he was very reliable. He was funny. He was an excellent teacher. Um, he could lead. He was a really great leader. And many people um, just accepted his leadership because he was so talented. Um, I think it was a combination of that strength, reliability, leadership, and humor that really uh, nailed it for me. Plus, it was a, a time where I took on some leadership, and I I really rose to the occasion as a saxophone section leader in 1980 and 81. <laughs> wow. And we had some amazing experiences together in the band, including a national championship. So it was a very important group experience for me and a personal experience of leadership and having uh, a role model who was so consistent. And in my case, a male role model at that point in my life, because my father had just died. So, oh, yeah, that's the first name who came to me. That's so moving and so beautiful. And so, Susie, I want to turn your hero back to you and say uh, you're reliable and funny you're a teacher you're a leader and other people accept your leadership because you're good at it and it's really like you said your strength reliability humor and consistency and that's you it is <laughs> i knew it I'm almost speechless, but we're on a podcast, so I really can't just <laughs> shut up. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so interesting. Yeah. So it's um, this is my way of the whole heroes thing. You know, in design, you don't ask direct things, but you kind of inspire people. So this is my way of asking you and others what are your values? Because in, we could send, you know, I could send these things to you and these are your values basically, right? Yeah. Um, and your values are the foundation of your design, whether you're designing a life or a toilet seat, frankly, <laughs> it's, <laughs> you need to know what's important. And so, the, and that's really the tipping point or the turning point of the process is once I can connect people with their values then I can get them to reconstruct their life and choose the ingredients that they want going forward. And then there's an important question, and you kind of um, alluded to this, a role model. So your heroes, and there could be multiple heroes, right? Actually show you the way of how to practice these values in life. And so then the question becomes like, what would you do to be more like Fred? And you're already doing it. But there are moments when our life throws us that funk you're talking about or the curveball yeah. um, where we need to strongly reconnect with our values because when we're shaken, we're like, okay, what am I doing wrong? And that foundation of values really becomes important. And then you can reconstruct. And then once you know the essential ingredients that you want, um, you can then express a life, an idea that's important to you and taking cues from your role models, using metaphors. And, and that leads to this idea that is your life or a part of your life that is true to who you are. And that's really the goal because um, according to this one research that was done um, in England, one of people's biggest regrets uh, when they're dying is that they, and I want to read this to you, hold on. They say, apparently, their number one thing is, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself. Mm. 
and not what others expected of me. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, I was like, there, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, because I, I know it's important for people to live, for us to live true to ourselves. And my way, you know, my way of getting to it is through design process. I love that. I call what you just did a sneak attack. It's a sneak attack because things like values and passions really throw people. It's like they, it sounds too big, too murky. I can't figure it out. It's too out there. And you need to sneak and and kind of (laughs) surprise your brain to, to spit it out. So you did that with the heroes. I like that sneak attack. It's a sneak attack. One of the ways I do it is with passion. And I, I take, I have an exercise that takes people back. I call it the happy highlights of the book of life, of your book of life. And I take people through their lives in thinking about your life as chapters and look for moments of joy, like a single moment of joy from when you were six, a moment of joy from when you were, you know, in junior high. And then looking for patterns in those moments of joy, because as you know, a lot of times when we think about phases of our life, the drama and the trauma and the hardship and the challenge is what pops out. And often we use that as our narrative to define that chunk. But when we look at moments of joy, it's kind of a sneak attack because we're looking for little moments. And when you look at a pattern of a life of these little moments, you can find clues for what's been consistent. And so what you just did with that hero exercise was definitely a sneak attack, because if you would have just asked me, what are my values, I would have stumbled more. Yeah, I don't think it would have been so personal. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So good. So good. I love that. Thank you for uh, going there with me. I was a little (laughs) nervous. (laughs) I thought, uh (laughs) uh-oh. No, that was really, it was really useful. And I really understand what you were saying. That's for sure. Tell us a little bit more about your process. So now we've deconstructed and now we have some values. What else can we do? So um, one of the things that is important at the end of the day, what's designing your life? It's really living with intention, right? Yes. And, And you were, before our conversation, you were telling me, that you also teach this and it's really helping people um, catch themselves so that they can kind of connect with what's important versus what's not important. And then for the things that are important, develop habits, right? Exactly. So um, one of the things that I do is when people write down their ingredients, like they deconstruct their life, um, I asked them, did, did you put love there? And, and not everybody does. Hmm. So then I, I'm like, well, do you want love to be part of your life? And even making them aware of that, that love is an, you know, we take it granted, but we need to be intentional about it. Right. So definitely. Again, we feel it's so common to just think that things happen to you. And that's part of what happens with this autopilot living. And we're not being intentional because we have an underlying belief that things will just happen to us and that we don't have enough power to create. And the other thing is that you confirmed that so many of us are created. Most most people are creative, but most people don't believe that they're creative. We're all creative. I mean, I remind people, were you five? And they're like, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> did you draw a stick a stick figure or make something out of plasticine or, you know, Play-Doh? Yeah. Okay. So that's it. <laughs> that's all you need. And it's kind of like uh, riding a bicycle. You can really reconnect with that creativity. And um, so I want to come back to that. But just about love, I wanted to mention something that I learned from our research with older people is that as we grow older, we start to love ourselves more. We have more self-compassion. We're more forgiving towards ourselves. We do become a better friend to ourselves. And I thought, you know, this is really something that I want. I wish people to learn earlier, like our kids. And 
it happens naturally over time because you know you have more life experience and you you become wiser so now i ask people not only you know do you have love in there but who who do you love and nobody says like i love myself <laughs> very rarely <laughs> and and that's my opening to say well put yourself in there because that's the biggest gift you can give yourself if you can love yourself a little bit more and this is for me as well right um then you have more love for other people and so that, that's one of the lessons i mean it's lessons like that that got me to write this book because i was like oh my god like there is so much wisdom that we can learn from our elders but let's not wait you know why wait that's so good. I want to point out that the book is very easy to read. And I love that a designer, <laughs> an industrial designer has created a book because it's so accessible and it's got some very simple and beautiful and very ex explanati explanatory. What is the word? Explanatory. <laughs> That's the word. Yes. Um, il illustrations. So it's a, it's a very easy read and I just love how it's designed. I wanted you to talk a little bit more about the elders and the importance of co-designing with people 65 plus. I just thought this was such a unique take on this whole process. You know, and it really is. And it changed the way we think about um, aging. And here's why. Um, you know, most design research is you ask people, how do you feel? What are your problems? You know, and then people tell you their problems or you observe them going through something and you can note here are the problems that they're dealing with because we love problems. I mean, design is all about problem solving. If you don't have a problem, <laughs> you can't solve it. You know, you, you can't improve on something. If somebody was looking at me getting bonked in my nose with this stupid handle on my water bottle, that would be the problem. Susie's that getting they, bonked exactly. on her nose. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, next iteration, they would take that handle off, right? It's so a that stupid handle. <laughs> solve the problem. So, um, so one thing that we did differently was instead of observing people or asking them, we thought we, we need to collaborate with you. Um, and the reason for that is very simple. We needed help because we were a younger group of designers and we didn't really know what it meant to be older. And so we said, why don't we collaborate with you? Would you like to come and be a designer with us for a day? And people were so excited and interested. And Susie, I love this. Nobody said to us, you're kind of late, you know. <laughs> I've been interested. I've been interesting for a long time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. There were people who were in their 60s, but there were people who were in their 70s, 80s, and 90s who were like, we're game. We're going to talk to you. We're going to collaborate. And so what we found out is when you ask people to design their life, it's not that they don't have challenges, but they refuse to be defined by, by those challenges. And instead, they're excited about having ideas for their life. And they, they basically said, the thrill is not gone. The thrill is on. We, we are thrilled to be alive. Wow. And that's, that, th that's a beautiful idea, you know. I think that is a beautiful idea. But I'll tell you, in the 50s and 60s, I don't know that that understanding is so clear. Because it's such a jolt, um, getting into midlife, turning 50, turning 60, having these milestone birthdays tends to be very jarring for many, you know, and, and so many people, when I ask them when they're um, interested in working with me, if they have any, you know, issues about aging, do they have negative mindset? Do they have some weird thoughts about aging? And so many people say, no, I don't. I'm cool. But then when we coach, there, there's all kinds of negative thoughts going on that they don't even appreciate. You know, I had one that really surprised me years into doing this work. I noticed it when somebody would compliment me that I didn't look my age. Mm. Somebody would say, oh, you're turning 60. You don't look 60. 
And I would be, oh, thank you. And I'm like, why am I saying thank you? What am I making it mean? What's wrong with looking my age? You know, it was just so interesting that I got so excited about being told that I look younger than I am. Nobody said, well, no, really, you look 80. <laughs> you know, they didn't, <laughs> they didn't say that. It was always, you know, part of this cultural belief that, that youth is better. And when I pointed it out, like, first, I needed to understand myself and what thoughts I had that I saw it as such a desired compliment. But then when I started to point it out to other people, everybody was surprised. There is, there tends to be, not everybody, but there tends to be a lot of, you know, negativity that the best is over. The best isn't really yet to come. The best is over. And whatever's ahead, it's not going to be as great as what happened already. So I love hearing what you have to say about this. You, you just explained my deep desire to write this book. Because, <laughs> great. <laughs> because uh, when you say a lot of people, it's 87% of Americans fear aging. Oh, wow. That is a lot. <laughs> yeah. But then when we co-designed with people, uh, what we found out is that they don't fear aging. And that was really the positive uh outcome of all this is that they they are really about i think there there is a couple of things going on one of them is all the stereotypes that we have especially in this country um where youth is really valued mm. but you know when you get older it's you know there's true ageism and but i think we're going to see that change because the ageism that we're experiencing, I think it's also this notion that in the 50s, for example, lives were shorter. You know, people in their 60s, they thought, okay, you know, I'm going to retire. I'm going to relax a little bit. And most people died when they were 65. Wow. Um, but, but today we have another 20 years potentially 25, 30 years longer, and our kids even more so. And that really, you, you can't just like go, okay, well, I'm done. No, you're not done. <laughs> and and in fact, it's interesting because you, you're you like, you have your 20s, then you have your 40s, then you have your 60s. And then it, you know, it goes on. And so, and my question is like, well, what do you want to do with that life? It's a gift, you know? Um, it really is a gift. And, and I know, uh, regular listeners of the podcast know that my parents died young and I've outlived them both by many years. Now they, none of them got to be my age. Um, mm -hmm. and so having that happen to me when I was so young, I, I really did appreciate that it is a privilege to age yeah. and not everybody gets that privilege. So why not just grab it and, and really enjoy it. And so that really came out when you were working with these elders on this project. And I love that. It really came out and they basically told us, look, we're same and different. We're same in the sense that the same things that are important to you are important to us. And those are the four pillars of my book, love, purpose, well-being, and friendship. How we can get to these things is different. And, but that idea that we are same creates this incredible empathy. And also the recognition that, you know, just because we're of a different age doesn't mean that we can't connect. This whole intergenerational um, society is really our future where it's not either or, but it's young and older people together. Um, and I, I'm really excited about that. And I'm also excited about the, uh, the things that we've learned from older people, like how they create meaning, you know, and they create meaning by helping others. They create meaning by fighting for what they believe, uh, by learning, by teaching, uh, by being creative. And it's really, it makes up for the, we, well, we call them, we coined them in the study astronauts of life. 
<laughs> going where no one has gone before because nobody has lived this long before, right? And so th there is a bit of that where you have to innovate uh, while you wait for social structures and companies to catch up with creating things for this new era uh, of life. And, and I think um, corporations are catching up. There's so much value. I think we forget, at least in the earlier midlife years, when you start to, you know, uh, deal with this new perception of age and what your thoughts and feelings really are about aging, that we also have experience. We're not just older, but we're also wiser. We're older yes. and wiser. wiser. And we have a ton of transferable skills. But I find that this idea of transferable skills isn't really appreciated um, as to how important that is to do anything else in, uh, you know, uh, for work, for career, as an entrepreneur, as a mentor, in creative pursuits. They're transferable skills. We've learned so much by having so much experience. Yeah, actually, there's a name for it. It's called crystallized intelligence. Ah, amazing. <laughs> amazing, yes. <laughs> And cognitive science actually, uh, in psychology recognizes this and that our, the way we think changes over time and crystallized intelligence is, it explains the wisdom of our elders because we have experience and we start seeing patterns. And so we can recognize patterns much more quickly. And that's why we're good mentors. We are experts. And, um, and again, it's kind of like younger people have fluid intelligence and we have crystallized intelligence. When you put them together, that's, you're getting the best of both worlds. And, um, so that's really important. And then taking the long view on life is really important. And when you start seeing, hold on one second, um, life is long. You know, we're now living to our eighties potentially more. When we started mapping that out, something very interesting appeared. And that is, you were just talking about like, like uh, telling me about your kids leaving. My kids, one of them left, the other is leaving next year. I'm in the process of becoming an empty nester. And but our research showed us that my kids and us in this time, we're very similar. We're very similar, and I'm going to put it in, in a very short phrase for you. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> and it's in my book as well. Because, you know, we're interested in those things, and we don't have our kids, and, you know, for people who don't have kids, um, they have, uh, there's a whole new freedom that emerges where you have some disposable income, um, you can move into a smaller apartment. You know, our kids are moving into their college dorms. We can move into a smaller apartment. We're not as connected or attached to uh, physical goods anymore, but we're interested in learning things. We're interested in travel and uh, the whole myth of like, we, we lose some of that, um, of our in interest in love is not true. <laughs> I can go on and on. There's um, some of the biggest uh, buyers of music is older people mm. um, with lots of recreational drugs. So <laughs> it's so funny that you mentioned the music. Um, we had a very interesting thing happen during COVID with my kids moving home. And so I have three sons in their 20s. And one of them thought that we should rethink the living room. Mm. So we have a very uh, a, a, a fantastic um, music system in the living room uh, with high end speakers, like big ones, like people don't have big speakers anymore, but we do. <laughs> and and it's a it's an amazing place to listen to music. But he thought I hadn't done anything interesting with it. And he suggested that we update the CD player. The receiver broke. So we needed to get a new receiver. He wanted us to have lights on the ceiling up lights, up lights on the plants. And he wanted me to actually get rid of the CDs because they're old fashioned and I should be streaming. 
So then we had to start um, investigating all the different streaming options, and some of them are higher quality than others. And it got into this really techie and design and comfort. Like he, nobody wanted a TV in there. It's just, he said, make it a proper, more comfortable listening room. And it started a massive project of reorganizing things, making some purchases, moving furniture, buying a few things on Amazon. And I was a little bit um, resistant at the beginning. I I tried everything he suggested, except we didn't replace the couches because we have a big dog who we don't want a big dog on new furniture. It's bad enough. He's a big dog sometimes on old furniture. So we didn't deal with the furniture. But oh my God, it was something we totally had in common. He discovered some of my jazz and I discovered some of his music that, you know, I haven't found new music in about 20 years. And so it was so much fun. It was so much fun and it brought us all together. Perfect. You you just demonstrated same different. Yeah. And that same different creates an incredible reciprocity where you can learn from each other, share experiences, and you're aligned, except it's not this, totally the same thing, you know? That is so funny. I Your mean, I even, I even interest, I introduced to him as we were just pulling out all these old CDs, like they completely covered the dining room table in stacks that we have a ton. And I was finding stuff and he was very, the, the one son in particular was very curious about it. So I introduced him to some of this music. And then it turned out that he was, he's a drummer. And so he was downtown and he ended up being invited up on a stage to play with a drummer who he recognized from something I had introduced him to. Wow. (laughs) The whole thing came full circle that he even knew who this guy was. It was hilarious and amazing. Because I don't want to go to any of these places he's listening music. I don't want to go out late. I don't want to eat late. I don't want to go in a bar. I don't want to be with people. Those are those are different things. But um, but I love that he's going. Yeah. And then the other boys also, everybody really appreciated what we had done in there. And then he left. And the other son left. So there's one son remaining. And he took the fancy light that was on the ceiling And just before the holidays, I purchased my own. I could not believe I did it. It's a light that (laughs) it looks like an Aurora Borealis on the ceiling. (laughs) It's fantastic. Who knew? I I need to ask you for that. after. I will give you the link. (laughs) Yes. No, it's really so beautiful. And you're making me think also the the social connections, you know, that you're talking about, um, the conversations, sharing an experience together. And and that's the other thing that we found that was really important uh, for older people is how to make those social connections and have what I call fresh friends. And one of the uh, participants who came to our workshop said, advise us, make friends who are nine years younger and nine years older. And that really stuck with us. And of course, nine is just a number, but it kind of gives you a range, like you need younger people and older people. And it made me become self-aware that I had a lot of older friends, but I didn't have younger friends. Oh, I love that. And I thought, okay. So then I became intentional about like, who do I know uh, who's younger? I, I teach, so I have students. But I didn't really, like, they remain students. But now I'm, like, I want to hang out with them. And that's, you know, I want to be interested in them. And that really changed my perspective um, to nine years younger, nine years older. And that that also is, um, we found that the friendships are the heart of life. You know, they extend our life. And... So I have a whole chapter on how to make friends and tips on uh, creating friendship factories. I love that. Friendships come up a lot in the work that I do with the midlife community. And, you know, nine, just getting back to nine, nine's a very important number. Like it means life. It's a great number, right? And that's so interesting that it was above and below. I'm fascinated by that. And it makes perfect sense. 
It makes perfect it, sense. It encourages, again, this idea of intergenerations, working together, being together, learning from each other. And, um, and it reminds me of one of the things that my team and I would talk about is like, if you go to Italy or you go to Mexico or even like different neighborhoods in the States, you see some cultures have like these big trees and village squares and under it, young people and older people all mixed together. And so you have grandparents, parents, and children, you know, little children running around and then uh, parents having a drink and older people playing backgammon or cars or whatever. And it's that kind of kind of mix that we need to create here as well in the States where you're not only hanging out with people your age. And, and I think that's kind of something we can work towards in one thing I know about living in the States is when people start to realize something is good for you, it eventually comes to happen. You know, people invest in it individually, but also corporations do as well. So I'm, I'm really hopeful. I'm an optimist. That's awesome. You know, I'm just reminded of one of the interviews I did a while ago. It was about a mother, like a, I think she was 90, the mother and the daughter who was in her um, late fifties, early sixties. And they were playing Mahjong together. Mm. And yeah. what's kind of happened in my neighborhood in this part of Toronto is there's a lot of Maj going on. And I don't know anything about this, except I know that there are jokes made about people playing Maj in Florida. <laughs> and I don't really understand the game. I've never played it. But I have a lot of friends who are playing it. And it's intergenerational. It's maybe so that, cool. Maybe you'll start learning and then tell me if it's easy to learn or not. <laughs> It seems, I don't know, it seems hard to me, but I can send you a link. In fact, I'll put a link to that episode in the show notes because it's the cutest story of how uh, how it became came to be, how the daughter learned it, and now how popular it is, and how many friends they've made as a result of playing Maj. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the actually uh, tricks for the Friendship Factory is having a shared space, shared interests. And share time. If you can bring those things together and do something together, it accelerates trust. And then trust leads to wanting to know each other better. And that is the beginning of a friendship. That makes perfect sense. I can really see that. And we've had that a bit on these vacations that we take that are sailing. We've done it a few times. And it's uh, we've done it with the kids a few times too. And there aren't other kids. It's a catamaran. So there's maybe 10 or 12 people on there. And they have been hanging out with the people my age and having a grand old time. And, the, and people my age are loving their energy and their jokes and their stories. And it's been really fun because it's very intergenerational in that experience. And I really, um, now that we're talking about it, everybody's having a good time. Nobody has said, oh, there's a bunch of old people. Everybody's interesting and having fun. Yeah. Beautiful. Going underwater, scuba diving together. Like what's not to love about that? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the last thing I just wanted to mention, and we've talked about it a little bit, is your um, your experience that these elders that you were working with to inform the direction of the book and to really give you insight and do this research with, that the optimism really did permeate their experiences and their reflections and the way they were living their lives. Did that surprise you at all? It did. Because, again, based on research that has come before our project, um, a lot of the information was quite reductionist. Yeah. Uh, that you age and something goes wrong. And whether it's your family structure, financial structure, work or health. Um, and so we kind of started with all that knowledge, preconception, right? Um, and the beauty of it is that we were able to break those preconceptions through co-design. And people told us, yes, we do have challenges. Yes, things do break down, but it is really thrilling to be alive. And so you get past that. So somebody literally said, it's kind of like, yes, I fell down. I scraped my, my knee. I got up 
and I continue to walk. Or another person said, we take a risk, no matter what our age, every time we leave the house. And so, you know, why not? And that, that optimism and that sense of um, a growth mindset is yeah. what, what we found, really. Not reductionist, but quite the opposite. Um, it was having a growth mindset that we have so much expertise and we continue to have experiences and learn from them and, you know, continue our life. So good. Actually, there's one more thing I want to ask you about while I have you here. Um, tell me about these virtual teas. Oh, I'm so glad you asked. So the virtual teas, we started them at the very beginning of COVID. And I reached out to my community and said, so we meet once a week uh, so that we can design our life through COVID together. And there was this outpour of interest. And so we started doing them and our next virtual tea is um, tomorrow, Wednesday, uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, New York time, because that's where I am. And in people from all over, actually, I have people from Toronto joining us as well. And, and what we do is every week, um, we take one of the exercises and think about our life creatively. But it is a friendship factory. That's what I'm realizing, that it's a great way for people from different backgrounds, disciplines, and different ages to come together. And our shared project is our life, our creativity. And it creates uh, a very authentic group of people. And so we all, you know, show up and think about our life, different sets of it. And I have also guests um, every couple of weeks who teach us something that uh, we didn't know before. And it started at the height of COVID, but we still continue. And um, and your listeners are very welcome. Uh, you're very welcome. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. Thank you so much. I'll have the link, of course, to that. And with the book, Design the Long Life You Love, a step-by-step guide to love, purpose, well-being, and friendship. Is this easy to find at all the places? It's easy to find in all the places and Amazon and your favorite online bookstore or a lot of the uh, neighborhood bookstores. My neighborhood bookstore carries it. So I went there the other day and I was like, this is my book. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Aisha, thank you so much for joining us today. It was super lovely and inspirational. And I just can't wait to... um to get the response from this episode, because you've really like our teaching is very similar, but different. And you've given me so much more to think about and so much more perspective. And I'm really grateful. Susie, thank you so much. This was a wonderful collaboration, I think, between the two of us. Thank you for having me. Amazing. Also, there are some TED Talks. I'll be including those links as well in the show notes. And is there anything else you want to share? No, I, I'm so glad you mentioned the virtual tea. Uh, and you'll have the link, but it's ishabeyourcell.com backslash newsletter. We'll get people on our newsletters and they'll know whatever I'm doing, where I'm going, what's top of mind. Because I definitely want to know what's in your mind. <laughs> so interesting. Thank you so much and have an amazing life. Thank you. A long life. A very long life. (laughs) Thank you. Okay, that's it for this episode. Pretty interesting, right? I highly recommend you check out Aisha's TED Talks as well. So good. I was absolutely floored when she walked me through the hero work. Consistency, reliability, funny, and leadership. There it is. (laughs) Values that I think are important and emphasize as well in my work. I couldn't believe it. Now, the other thing I really appreciated about her work is the way she applied her expertise in design to another really important project and then conducted research with older people and invited them into the development of the book. I hope you found Aisha as interesting as I did. And I want to leave you with the question that she brought up about accepting yourself more as you age. Do you believe this idea that you actually love yourself more the older you get? 
Is that something you want for yourself? Why or why not? I love this idea personally, and it's why I focus so much on curiosity and compassion in my coaching, in my work. Midlife women like us tend to be so hard on ourselves, and really, it's a skill that you can totally learn. I always say curiosity and compassion for the win. Okay, so as you know, this podcast is all about how to love your life again after 50. It's really all about coaching you to become more intentional and to incorporate mindfulness in your life as a regular practice. And mindfulness is the key ingredient to regret-proofing your life. This is how you put yourself in your agenda. My focus as your midlife coach is to help you get unstuck, clear, and excited about your life again. Being stuck can be rough, but it doesn't have to mean you're completely immobilized. (laughs) That's what it feels like, though, but it doesn't have to mean that. It could just be that you're not where you want to be in your life in general or your business, or maybe it's the intersection of the two. Another common reason you might feel off is that you're too darn busy and have no work-life balance, whatever that means. The bottom line is that you know you're meant for more and you don't want to waste valuable time. So if you're ready to make some important changes and want to be way more clear about what you want and how to get there, I can help you create the success you're craving. That's why I created the Women in the Middle Academy. It's a warm, supportive, and fun coaching community of like-minded women. You can absolutely be more fulfilled than ever before. Email me your questions and let's talk about it. Go ahead and book your momentum call at www.womeninthemiddleacademy.com. For show notes and links, head over to www.susierosenstein.com and click the podcast tab and look for episode 301. And if you're interested in applying to be a guest on my new upcoming podcast, Women in the Middle Entrepreneurs, head over to www.midlifeinterviews.com and apply. Thanks so much for listening. It's time for you to put yourself first, one thought at a time. I'm Susie Rosenstein, and I'll talk to you next week.